Welcome back. In this next part of Lecture 3, we're going to examine the Kuwait cell again, this time with a power law fluid. If we think back to the Kuwait cell with a Newtonian fluid, we saw that the workflow that we did to get a velocity field came in two parts. We looked at the torque balance to start with, and then integrated through the combination of that torque balance with a constitutive law to get an intermediate result. Then we effectively did the same bit of calculation again, just with different integration limits, substituted in the intermediate result to get for a Newtonian fluid an expression for angular velocity profile that was independent of the fluid rheology, or in the case of a Newtonian fluid, mu. We're going to do the same workflow now for a power law fluid, and we'll see that there's a key difference that the angular velocity profile does in fact depend on one of the rheological parameters. And actually what we'll see is that there's a practical consequence for this that's very relevant to chemical engineers. So let's start by having a look once again at our Kuwait cell in schematic form. Remember that a Kuwait cell is a solid cylinder sitting concentrically within a hollow cylinder. The gap between the two is filled with a fluid. In our example, the inner cylinder is rotated at a given angular velocity, and the outer cylinder is held stationary. If you recall our conversation on Kuwait's for Newtonian flow, we said that the gap is narrow, because if the gap isn't narrow, we risk generating secondary flows, in this case, Taylor vortices. So again, we're going to assume a nice narrow gap. So. If you recall how we started this analysis for a Newtonian fluid, we looked at what torque was equal to in terms of the force on the periphery of the inner cylinder and the lever arm over which that force acted. And there was the result on the blackboard that we found. We saw that our gam gamma, our torque, is equal to the force due to shear, which is tau r theta r shear stress on the radial face in the theta direction multiplied by the area of that surface, which is 2 pi r times L, multiplied by the lever arm, which is just simply the radius of that inner cylinder, which is why we have an R squared term. And if you recall for our Newtonian analysis, we said that, look, tau r theta is a function of our deformation, our velocity gradients, and then that gave us something to integrate. So we're going to do the same again. So here on the blackboard now, top left in blue and in white is a reminder of that torque expression. And in the centre of the board, there is the expression for torque with the power law constitutive equation substituted in. And we can see that we've got K, our consistency index, multiplied by gamma dot, which is R d omega by dr, raised to the power n. And so that gives us something to integrate. With a little bit of rearrangement, we get the following integral, and again, we're going to assume no slip boundary conditions when we look at our integration limits. And so we're going from a zero angular velocity on the outer cylinder to whatever angular velocity the inner cylinder is rotating at. And we can see that those angular velocity limits correspond to the relevant radii, r naught for a zero velocity and ri for a non-zero velocity. Remember our conversation on no slip, how we have to be really careful whether that's true or not. So we're going to integrate with care because we've got indices and fractions to deal with. And with a little care, we can get an expression for omega i. So there we have it in terms of a group of torque and in terms of a group involving radii. Now remember for our Newtonian workflow, we rearranged this such that we had an intermediate result that was for that group of terms including torque. And we're going to do exactly the same here. So here's our intermediate result, which we're going to call A. Our group of terms on the left-hand side, including torque. And on the right-hand side are, by and large, geometric terms, although now our geometry is affected by our power law index, because we have 2 over n rather than just 2. So next step in the workflow, do the same integration, just with a change of limits. And I've highlighted on the blackboard how those integration limits change. We're now integrating from the inner cylinder to an arbitrary point in the flow, because we want to be able to see what the velocity field looks like. And 
at an arbitrary point in the flow at radius little r, we have an arbitrary angular velocity omega. So let's do the integration one more time. And as expected, we have a result that involves that torque expression that we can substitute in for a again. So there highlighted in blue is where we're going to use that intermediate result. And now substituted in is that intermediate result with a bit of rearrangement and a bit of tidying up. And we can see that the principal lesson here is that our angular velocity as a function of radius is now no longer independent of the fluid rheology. It involves our power law index. It doesn't matter about the consistency index. And that doesn't come as a surprise because if we think of the Newtonian expression, it didn't depend on the viscosity. And so the fact that for a power law fluid, the expression doesn't depend on consistency index is, is compatible with that. However, it does depend on how quickly the fluid shear thins, which is why the power law index n is present. There's a practical consequence to this, so let's examine what that practical consequence is. On the blackboard now is one quadrant, one quarter of our cuet. We can see highlighted in yellow is the inner cylinder. Our outer cylinder, which is stationary, is that arc, also highlighted in yellow. And particularly emphasising our, in this diagram, not quite so narrow gap, but I wanted to make it bigger to emphasise the point, our narrow gap containing fluid. And what we're going to do now is look at the velocity profile across that gap. So the graph that appears is plotting the absolute velocity as a function of location within the gap inner surface to outer surface. And the yellow line on that graph is what we see with a Newtonian fluid, or by setting n equals to 1 in our result for a power law fluid. However, as we change n, we find that the further we get away from that inner cylinder, the more the fluid becomes stationary. Until we can see that, for example, with that blue curve, where n equals 0 0.2, we have a substantial reduction in angular velocity in over half the width of the gap. OK, so what? Think with your engineering hat on. As chemical engineers, we often need to mix stuff up. And if you think about mixing things, a large family of mixers are rotational mixers, paddles in tanks and so on and so forth. So if we think about what this result is telling us, it's telling us that shear thinning fluids are harder to mix rotationally because the velocity field extending out from that rotational element decays far more quickly than it does for a Newtonian fluid. So the practical consequence of shear thinning fluids impacts how we design rotational mixing equipment. So again, with your engineering hat on, that's something very much to remember. Now, let's recap a few key points. We've re-examined the Kuwait cell, and we've looked at how to derive our angular velocity field as a function of radius, and in doing so, we've reminded ourselves what torque is equal to. For a power law fluid, we've seen that the mathematics is tractable. We have to be a little bit careful in handling indices and fractions, but other than that, it's straightforward. We can, again, perform our sanity check by setting n equals to 1, our power law index equals to 1, to make sure that we revert to a Newtonian expression. And if we do, we know we're correct. And if we don't, we know we've made a mistake. We see that for a power law fluid in rotational flow, the velocity profile now actually does depend on the rheology. And this is an important departure away from our Newtonian case, which actually has practical consequences, which is that rotational mixing is poorer and harder hence more energy intensive, in shear thinning fluids.